He pastored a church in a place called Washington, Georgia. Now, before I go any further, how many of you have ever heard of this man by the name, or this pastor by the name, of Homer Grice? Very good. All right. You may not know his name. You may not know that he was the pastor at, uh, at, Wash at a church in Washington, Georgia. But I bet you remember one of the things that he became known of back in the 20s, and certainly is one of the things that he has, has done in such a manner that you practice it and do it today, and that is uh, something that we're gonna talk about tonight. Now, as we have Vacation Bible School, by the way, just to let you know, he is the original director for the Southern Baptist for Vacation Bible School, the original director. He, he's the one that started Southern Baptist churches uh, going and actually using and participating in Vacation Bible School. Prior to that, it, uh, Vacation Bible School was mainly an inner city thing. It was done in places like New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, places like that. And a lot of those places actually had their Vacation Bible Schools during summer and, and did those things. But in the South, we didn't have Vacation Bible School. And those churches that did were very sparingly, very rare did you come across a Southern Baptist Church that had Vacation Bible School. Homer, Bri Homer Grice was asked to go to Nashville and there in Nashville become a part of the Sunday School Board and there begin to develop a program called Vacation Bible School for Southern Baptists. And so in 1924, he, he's, he's called away from his church there in Georgia and he moves to Nashville to start a year-long process so that in 1925, things are... are uh, laid out for, for folks to do. As we gather for Vacation Bible School, one of the things we do, we have songs, we, we know that, we have the march, and uh, we have all those things, and so we practice those. The kids coming in by age, they take their spot. We have the, the uh, pledges, the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag, and then we do what? Hold on, don't answer. I want one of the kids to answer. We do the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, we then do the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag, and then what do we do? The, uh, the Bible, Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. Would you believe that this man, this Homer Grice, is the man who sat down and took the Psalms 119 that we're getting ready to read, and he penned out the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible, and our children say that during every vacation Bible school, every day that we have Bible school. That's what they say. They pledge allegiance to the Bible. And that began in 1925 in churches throughout the South in particular, but all throughout the nation, a vacation Bible school saying a pledge of allegiance to the Bible. Now, as we read, uh, who wants to, uh, do any of you all want to say the pledge of allegiance to the Bible? Any of you kids want to say the Just Go ahead, say the pledge of allegiance to the Bible. Huh? If I help you with it? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. And that's how we practice. Uh, and that's, or not how we practice, that's how we pledge to the Bible. Let's read our passage of scripture, and then we're going to talk about this pledge and what it means. But it's found in Psalm 119. We're going to begin reading with verse 9. 
Bible says this, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto unto thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And as we read that passage of Scripture, what we see is the question, how does a person know how to make right that which they've done wrong? Look, look there again at verse 9. It says, uh, and it's a question, wherewithal or how shall a young man cleanse his way? How shall a young man walk in the right path? How shall a young man make right his steps in his life and in his walk? And so tonight, I want us to understand that when we give a pledge of allegiance to the Bible, and by the way, how many of you parents as well as children, how many of y'all have ever said the pledge of allegiance to the Bible, either in vacation Bible school or during church or, or during whatever? Most of you, right? When you do the Pledge of Allegiance to the Vacation Bible School, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible, what are you pledging to do? What do you think? What are you pledging to do when you pledge an allegiance to the Bible? Memorize. Okay, so you're going to memorize the Bible. All right. Someone else? Be guided by, okay. Uh, anyone else? Study. Study. Someone else. You're going to study, memorize, and then put it into practice, right? One of the things that sometimes we forget, we, we teach people the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible, and, and we forget to tell what that means. And so we assume that our children just know what that means. But if you ask a lot of the children, what they will tell you is, I'm going to read my Bible every day. And that's what they get. And that's that's part of it. That's half of it. And that's the right thing to do. To read the Bible every day. But what's the other step to it? It's not just reading it. What else is it? You're pledging to live by it. Meaning, not only am I going to read it, but I'm going to actually put into practice what I read. It, it's not just a matter of saying, I'm going to know what it says. It's saying, I'm not only going to know that, I'm going to actually live by how the Bible tells me I should live. The reason why we do that, because it's whose word? God's word. And so tonight, if we, if we get nothing else out of, uh, out of tonight, I want you to take with you the importance that we're going to have children here for Vacation Bible School that are going to need to know that it's not just about reading God's Word, but once we read it and have an understanding of it, we're supposed to live that way. That God expects us to live that way. Uh, as adults, do you ever feel like that God has told you how to live a certain way, but when you look up and look around, you realize maybe you've not done exactly what God wanted you to do? Anybody ever? I, I know I have, right? Um, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why do we know how to live one way, but when we look up and look around, we realize we're living another? Why would we do that? What, what would cause us to know one thing, but to do another? All right, you want to explain that? What does that mean? Spirit's willing, flesh is weak. is we're not near as strong spiritually as sometimes we act like we are or even sometimes like we think we are. Uh, pride comes before the fall. Man, I'm, I'm spiritually where I need to be. I've been studying my Bible all week long. I know what God has told me to do. And I'm going to sit there and I'm going to go out and I'm just going to fight these giants on the battlefield and we go out and we forget one thing. 
were like David that would go out into the battlefield. But what would have happened had David gone out into the battlefield but forgot his sling and his stones? You see, I, I, I think sometimes we forget that God called David to go and fight Goliath. And so in faith, David was convinced that God would give him the victory. And so he went. But notice what God expected David to to do. David still ex was expected by God to go into battle. And you don't go into battle without the weapons that you need to go into battle. And so while God said, I want to give you the, the, the victory in this, he also told David, David, I also need to make you an example, but you got to do certain things. you got to fight the battle. Could he have done it without David? Yeah. He could have done it the whole way through. He didn't need David to defeat Goliath. He could have destroyed Goliath with just a word. But he needed David to be the example because David was being set up to do what? To become king of Israel. And so all of this is playing out. If David forgets the stone and the sling back, uh, back in the camp, now he's not going to be able to face the giant that God has put in front of him as an opportunity and now he's going to sit there and, and, and it's not going to be the story that we read about. Instead, it's going to be the humiliation of David because he didn't go prepared. And so that would have been what? The downfall of the proud. In our lives, it's the same way. We sit there, we read God's word, we study it, we apply it to our lives, we're all excited about it. We go out the door and then we go out into the world and we walk out and, and we face this Goliath, if you would, God wants to use us as a way in which to reach people, to, to use us as an example of his power and his might. But then we get out there, and we're not really prepared for the battle. We've just read up on the battle. Uh, give you an idea, I have read, uh, I bet at least 100 times about the Battle of Iwo Jima. Right? Read about it. I bet I couldn't fight it. Probably wouldn't want me as a commander Probably wouldn't want me out there guiding troops. Why? Because I've not been trained for any of those battles. But I've read about it. And that's how many times we practice our faith. We read about it. Here's what God wants me to do. And we read about it. But we're not trained to actually go into the battle because we've not applied it in our lives and, and approached it as God would have us to approach it. Uh, if... If we have these children come into our church and all they hear is that you're supposed to read your Bible every day, just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever read uh, Genesis? How, how many of you have ever read Genesis? Maybe not all the way through, but a lot of it, right? Do you all ever get bogged down in the genealogy? You ever start reading it and you're like, oh my goodness, that somebody begot somebody and then they begot somebody and somebody begot somebody. And it gets just dragging down, right? You're like, oh, man. That's not really all that exciting in a Christian walk, is it? You don't really learn a lot in your Christian walk reading somebody who got somebody who got somebody who got somebody. But lo and behold, if you were to go and you were to talk to somebody that, uh, in particular, that was a Jewish historian, and you were to ask them about genealogy, their eyes would light up. Why is that? What happens in the genealogy in Genesis? Anybody want to take a guess? Where does it take us to? Where does Genesis take us to? It'll eventually take us all the way to Jesus. But Genesis takes us where? Think it through. Where does Genesis go? Keep going. To Moses. Genesis takes us all the way up to the book of Exodus. All right? Genesis is the story that talks about the flood. Genesis is the story that talks about Adam and it talks about uh, the children of Adam. And, and what does Jesus do in his teachings? He goes all the way back to the book of Genesis and says, 
that there is a, that sin entered into the world by one man, by that name of Adam. And the world will be uh, uh, spared their sins by one man, by the man named Jesus. And so, yes, it does take us all the way up, all the way forward to, to Jesus. But when we go all the way back to Abraham, when we go all the way back to Noah, when we go all the way back to Moses, what we see is God's plan unfold, and we hear this, I have a promise for you. I have a promise for you. Now, I, I sort of cut Tony off because he was taking my thunder, and I didn't want him to get too far ahead of him. That promise goes back for the children of Israel, Abraham's seed. They get lit up about that. Why? Because there's a promise, a promise of Messiah. And it's written down in black and white. And so when you and I read genealogy, it gets really boring, really dumb. But not somebody from Abraham's, uh, not somebody from uh, looking back to Abraham as the, uh, as the one that was given the promise by God. I'll ask this question real quick and then we'll move on. As you read the book of Genesis, what does it tell you to do? Have you ever thought about that? What does the book of Genesis tell us to do, Tony? What do you think? Do what? Follow God. Follow God. Okay, somebody else? Be faithful, right? Follow God, be faithful. So as we read the book of Genesis... What we ought to be taking from it is not just the genealogy. What we ought to be taking from it is the lessons that God has for us to do everyday life, to walk with Him, to have faith in Him, to trust in Him, to be faithful back to Him. Now I'm going to go all the way to the book of Revelation. What does the book of Revelation tell us? What is the whole thing throughout the book of Revelation? Believe it or not, the book of Revelation was actually not written to scare you. The book of Revelation actually is to bring hope and to bring peace and to bring comfort to the Christian. And the reason why is that even the most vile, ugly person that has even after the rapture continued and continued and continued to reject God, to turn away from God, do you realize that God in his suffering or in his long suffering still allows for someone to come to know Christ every step along the way until finally the battle? Every step along the way, God sits there and says, no, you don't have the Holy Spirit. No, you don't have the church. Yes, you are rebellious and yes, you've turned against me. And yes, there are all these consequences to that. And yet, in spite of all of that, you still find hope that you can become Christian. Now, the hard part is knowing in your own faith and in your own heart, you might be so bitter towards God you would never want God as your Savior if you're a person that's living through the tribulation. But here is God saying, I still have given hope even to the hopeless. And so here I am in a world that has the church. Here I am in a place that has the Holy Spirit. Here I am in a world where there are many people that I come in contact with that are faithful to God and committed to God and doing what God wants them to do. They're not rebellious. And I think to myself, if God is, is sparing and willing to wait and to be long-suffering for that person in the book of Revelation that has rejected God, even though God has continued and continued and continued to give the opportunity to do that, how much more so then is God going to use me if I'll be faithful to Him? Right? So we learn these lessons, and our children hopefully will learn these lessons and be raised in. Now, obviously, we can't start in the book of Genesis, end in the book of Revelations, and do that in a week's time for vacation Bible school. But you know what we can teach these kids in, in that period of time? This book is a book of hope. If you'll start reading and start studying, as you come up to something that you have a question about, if you'll start asking the questions, you'll start finding the answers of hope. And if you start living by what God tells you to do, and you start 
putting that in practice in your life, I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be easy, but I'm going to tell you this. It's going to be pleasing to God. And in that, there is great peace. I hope and pray that as you have come to tonight, that you've come prepared and ready to pray for Vacation Bible School. You do realize that this time next week, we're in Bible School. It's here. That's exciting. That's exciting because I can't wait to see who God has already planned to start attending our Bible school. I can't wait to see what God has already prepared and laid open for us to teach and to share and to encourage and to do. I can't wait to see how God unfolds all of those things. And yet I know within my own heart, and I've seen it every year, every time, who do you think is going to fight us every step? going to be the devil, right? So, our prayer is this. God, we are going to need your help. We know that the devil hates Bible school. We know that the devil hates kids. We know that the devil hates the church. And we know that the devil really hates a church that's having Bible school to win kids for Jesus. And we need you to keep him at bay. We need you to keep our hearts protected. You, we need to keep focused. We don't need to get upset. And trust me, Here's what we've learned through the years. It's hot, and, it, and kids are loud, and they don't seem to cooperate. And, do what we're, and every once in a while, you have to remind yourself, this is for the kids. They're still getting it. God's still using me. I need to keep faithful because it's very easy to sit there, and me and Johnny come in on a, on a Wednesday night ready for Bible school. We're sitting there ready for it. These kids yelling and screaming and, and just having a time. And, and, okay, it's easy on Wednesday night to say, Okay, take a deep breath. What about Friday? Gone through two hot days. Now you're on your third hot day. Kids are all here. They're yelling and screaming. You don't think they're, they've heard you one bit. They've not listened to you the whole way through. And then Johnny comes up and says, Hey, Tim, uh, better late than never because you happen to be running late. And then all of a sudden, Tim just looks at Johnny and goes, Johnny, you get off my case, right? And here's all these kids watching that. You think, Tim, that won't happen. Oh, that's exactly what the devil would love to happen, right? I say that not because I expect that to happen. I really don't. But it is cautionary that we need to be prepared every single day. And so that means we're going to be praying tonight. We're going to be praying all the way till next Wednesday night. And then starting on Wednesday night, I'm going to challenge every one of our teachers, every one of our parents, every one of our volunteers uh, no matter what you're doing in the church for Vacation Bible School, that every night you go home and you give God thanks for being able to work for Bible School, and that every morning you get up and you say, God, I need to be ready tonight, so you just prepare me right now and get me ready so I'm focused so that you can use me the way that you want to use me. Don't let me lose my temper. Don't let me get upset. Don't let me get frustrated. You just keep me in check so that I can be my best for these kids and let God do all the, uh, all the work and let him receive all the glory. With that being said, I, I want to ask real quick before we go into praying, what do you expect from Bible school? With a show of hands, just raise your hand and I'm going to call on you. But what do you expect from va Vacation Bible School next week? Anybody, what's that? Plant a lot of seeds. Okay, someone else? And hopefully salvation for somebody. Okay, anyone else? And a good time. All right. New people in the doors. Okay. Someone else? Spaghetti corn dogs on it. Yeah. Yeah. And believe it or not, let me tell you, get ready for this. There will be those kids that that's all they start out coming for. And God grins. Because you know what's going on while they're waiting for their corn dogs and their spaghetti or whatever it is that they're waiting to eat, they're hearing the word of God. And they don't even realize it. But the Holy Spirit is sitting there whispering in their ear, you better listen. You better listen. You better listen. Remember this. Remember this. Johnny, that's actually a good point. Someone else. Now we can't let it just be Connie and Johnny show. Come on, somebody got something, right? I think that this church showing love actually has as much an impact on kids getting 
same as opening the doors. And, but it takes both. But it takes both. Yeah. And what? And adults. And adults. And because what are we doing also? We're having an adult class. That's right. And adults. Someone else. And by the way, I'm glad you said that. Hi, Betty. Hi, Gina. I promised I would say that tonight before we close. They were watching from, from the beach, so it's raining on them down there. Someone else? Hearing that makes me just shiver thinking about it. Someone else? We'll take two more and then we'll pray. Two more. Would you dismiss us with a word of prayer, please? Here's the Bible, Lord. I'm